My name is Arjen van Werken and I'm the Chief Operations Officer at Another Monday. And then you must be thinking, is this Monday? No, it's Sunday. But let me explain a bit. We are really astonished to find that one of the most used quotes in the English language is, thank God it's Friday. Which probably means that we as leaders are doing a poor job in making work fun. And why is work not fun? Because there's too many boring stuff around. And today I'm going to take you along an automation journey that will show you that automation is not just a thing of binary or even other kinds of computational stuff. It's something really different. And to first talk you through it, I'm going to take you back a bit in old school thinking. Tracy and Wiersman once told us there are actually three winning strategies. Either you have product leadership, or you are the best in customer intimacy, or you're a prize winner, operational excellence. That might have been through in the year 2000. Right now, that's no longer true. A winning organization needs to excel on all the elements at the same time, and there's a fourth one. So, yes, you need to be a product leader. Yes, you need to have the best product, as I said. Yes, you need to be the cheapest. Yes, you need to offer a superior experience. But you also need people to want to work for you. In almost all economies nowadays, there is a scarcity of people. People that can actually do something meaningful. So, in order to win, on the first three elements I mentioned, you also need to win on the fourth element. Today is a bit about automation, sometimes called RPA, robotic process automation, or intelligent process automation. It really doesn't matter how you call it. In the end, it's doing things in a different way. And it starts usually with a dream. We all have a dream. We all want to achieve something. And one of the things we want to achieve, usually, is operational excellence as first. I have some experience being a board member in some companies left and right, and at the end of the day, usually the CIO or the COO gets the classical question, can this be cheaper? And let's be honest, running a shrink to greatness scenario is something we all have been doing somewhere, somehow, but there is an end to it. Things like employee satisfaction, as I said before, product leadership, and your customer intimacy matter. And that is why it's so important to do something else. And something else start by having a dream. A real digital vision. And you should have this digital vision not on what kind of systems do I need. Because at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, everything can talk with each other. If you look at, for instance, on how we go into CTX-based systems, we don't need an API. As long as it's on the screen, we can capture it. So systems are not really that important anymore. And if you look at product leadership, usually product leadership has to do with how you bring things fast to the market. Well, bringing things fast to the market goes a lot easier if you have a very smart data integration strategy. And yes, it can be an API strategy, but if you don't have all these APIs, actually automation might be a very easy way to bypass this hindrance. And then it becomes to a digital vision. What is a digital vision? For me, a digital vision is not something that you say, this is my vision, and then reiterate it every once, twice, three times every five years or something like that. A digital vision has to do with something else. And what I'm talking to you about today is what we consider one of the most important points in a digital vision, which is lacking in a lot of visions because it's not sexy. It's about scalability. If you run automation, you should not be running automation as we do from a classical IT way of thinking. Test automation, for me, 
is working in patches, progressing stuff, doing stuff, do all, and then see what happens. In our real world, where we are today, automation is much more about real-time prioritization of the task at hand. Which means that if you want to start thinking on scalability, you really should have a clear understanding of the business need. For instance, if you have a contact center somewhere in your ecosystem or in your departments, contact centers usually have a real-time need. They're not interested in batch processing. Somebody is calling, I want to know now. I want to fix now. So your digital vision starts with clearly understanding what the business is all about. And then it starts for us with choosing the way how you want to do it, a methodology. Pick ours, pick up somebody else, doesn't matter. Pick one, stick with it. Because in a methodology, it usually is about very logical steps. It's about analyzing, trying stuff, testing it, and then bringing it in production. And CIOs are typically well equipped to understand that. Then there's technology. The interesting part in automation, that's why robotic process automation is somewhat not always delivering, is when your technology is there to automate the happy path, which in the businesses I'm working, is when something goes exactly as it was supposed to go. Well, I think we're business executives here, so we understand that usually process never go as documented. And there's a lot of different way how things are being done. So usually automating a happy flow based on very rigid technology gets you to 20, maybe 25% of automation. So all the concepts that are in the Agile framework, how to make it faster, bigger, are very important in your technology selection. If you don't select a technology that's able to deal with multiple happy flows and is not self-learning, you'll not get there. Let me give you an example on something we have developed. So you get a grasp on what AI or machine learning could do. If we're running a process and the process stops, we have enabled our robot to open up a chat screen with an employee and just ask the question, hello, I'm Angelique, I'm Robo23, this is what I'm doing, I cannot get further, what am I doing wrong? And then the employee just types in 140 characters what the bot is doing wrong. And then the bot will learn from it. This is what intelligence means, this is why technology selection is so important. If there is no self-learning system in there that actually helps you to get better, you will not get there. Change management. Actually, there was a brilliant presentation this morning from the oil and gas industry analysts from Gartner talking about culture hacks. How to do things across an organization, how to make things really happen, how to make things really smart. And the thing is, don't do it all in a big bang in one thing. Find the places where it really needs to happen, then start from there. All the lessons in change management we've learned over the years, either you win waterfall or agile, are all true. It is about engagement. Last but not least, governance. Why is governance so important? You are going to reach out and touch the work of people. Which means you get worker councils, you get employees that are maybe scared of what you are doing. Be very open, be very transparent, because what we have learned is that the best processes to find are the processes the employees say, please automate that. Because they know best what goes wrong. You don't need an expensive consultant for that. You have your own consultants. Now, automation does drive for you. This is a very nice overview from Gartner which shows you there's a development in business models and there is some kind of value drives. By the way, the slides will all be in the Gartner uh, thingy somewhere. And if you really want them, just drop me a tweet or whatever and I'll make sure you get them. What we see is that usually it all starts at the left-hand corner 
much about data quality, enhancement work, booking of payments, order planning, all kind of, let's call them, non-primary processes. Usually, a lot of RPA or IPA is doing done in procurement departments, in finance departments, which is all pretty cool, but it's not where the numbers are. The numbers are in the IT stream, the numbers are in the operations stream. So what we have seen over the years, that if you want to really drive value into automation, it might help doing some left-hand side work in the corner down there below to try out some stuff. But in the end, the real value goes when you go out wider and further, and dare to challenge further, dare to disrupt, dare to do, do things different. And it also means that you need to embrace a certain kind of uncertainty, because the farther you go out there, to the top-hand corner, the less you will actually know what's going to drive your value. Which brings me to a very important statement. I don't believe that if you automate, you should use license models. License models are regulated theft. Why? Because if you don't use them, you still pay. There's no incentive for success. That's not really smart. We believe that real automation might be run kind of like a temp agency. You pay for success. You pay when you need. Suppose when you're humongously successful and need to scale up, what's the most stupid discussion to have? Is it the discussion about the volume discount you want of the license? It's going to cost you a lot of time. Yes, think on that. We believe that in this world where everything can be measured, and everything therefore can be brought into activity-based costing, especially when you move into the automation space, move to activity-based costing. It also makes the discussion on the IT budget a lot less difficult because the ones having the benefits are also the ones that need to pay. So scaling is really hard. And why? Let's be honest. Everybody can get the CEO empowered on RPA or IPA or doing some kind of automation. Yes, let's go out there. And then we start doing some projects. And it immediately becomes difficult because uh, there needs to be a server somewhere and some desktop with local admin rights and all kinds of difficult stuff. And yeah, well, the IT department is not completely aligned and blah, 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 blah. Which means that these processes these projects, these proofing projects take way longer than expected, but also don't deliver the value. And then in the end, when you have been empowered, you have done some successful projects, you're going to run it. And running automation is extremely difficult and expensive at scale if you don't do it correctly. Let me give you an example. If we have 1,500 clients, let's call them boss, that are doing work, and then somewhere in the IT department somebody decides that's a nice service message to put in a pop-up window in SAP and say, please be aware this weekend you cannot work because we're doing system maintenance. If you don't have something called a pop-up blocker, your entire process will go down the drain. Because a robot is a stupid thing. It will do what is told. It knows where to click and what to do and what to put in there. And if there's sudden a, a screen in there it doesn't recognize, it blocks off. So this is a, a, a simple thing. The other thing is, you need to be able to manage changes fast. So to give you an example, we're able to run a bot farm that has 1500 bots, which is desktops, clients, virtual machines, all kinds of stuff. We maintain it with two people. It all has to do with classical, simple IT thinking, not doing bots to build as one, but build your bots from the ground up on microservices, and we call them microbots. Which means you need to think on that. You need to think on the security part. And you have to have a design for that before you start, because we have seen it in place 
that when the polls are finally running, the compliance department comes along and says, ah, we're not going to do this. Same goes for privacy. So architecture, privacy, security are all things that drive automation at scale. And no, they're not the most sexy products in the IT landscape, but they are so vital. They are so vital to build them up from the ground. That is why we believe that if you want to scale successful, it starts by having this defined digital roadmap and be ready to invest a bit. And let's be honest, we're not talking about millions here, we're talking about tens of thousands of euros. Do some stuff, try it out. Try multiple vendors, let's be honest. Don't get a lock-in on a single vendor strategy. That's strange, a vendor telling that, but we believe you should not do that. Work on your people and your culture. Build those digital skills. And the interesting one, the digital skills of the future are not the digital skills of today. Because, let me give you an example. When we started building our bots, everything was hard-coded. Then we went to a phase that we said, hmm, how can we make this low-coded on our own proprietary software? And ladies and gentlemen, we're now so far that if you have a process design, enter, enter, and the bot is built, and we call it no code. Mm -hmm. So the real digital, what you need, is actually not the developer, it's the business analyst, it's the people that really understand the business, what goes in, what needs to go out, and what are the paths we're taking. A strategic vision. Yes. I think we already talked a bit about this, but let me be a bit more specific about that. For me, a digital vision is something like this. Let me explain it for our company. We start with, we believe that we will change the way the world works. We do that by automating work that's non-value add, by the way we happen to build bots. It's one way of thinking about it. You won't hear me saying, I want to be a cost leader. You won't hear me saying, I want to be a product leader. Because those are elements, as I said before, when starting, that are things of the past. Things of the future are much more, I need to have them all, because if I don't have them all, I will be overtaken and I'll die. And then, of course, process and governance. Really said some things about it. It's all about embracing innovation. It's all about embracing change. But bring it in a very strong governance. And don't do the classical governance. The classical governance with steering committees, etc., will not get you there. RPA, IPA is a classical silo buster, which means it doesn't work on this level in organizations. It works on this level. And usually it has a lot to do with customer journeys, how to manage the customer journey through all of these silos. And using RPA as a silo buster is actually something that can create quite a lot of value for you. The three steps to success. One, legacy is not a problem. Please understand, legacy is not a problem. If it can be put somewhere on the screen, it can be automated. Let me give you an example. We have a client of ours, they have a booking system where they book, tra book all kinds of travels. And this system is somewhere in the basement and they don't dare to touch it. And it has this nice greenish screen with greenish letters on it. So once they built hard-coded a website where you could do some bookings. Pretty cool. But now they want to, to have WhatsApp. And then they went to the IT department and the IT department said, yeah, we have to do this project again. And yada, 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 yada. Really big. And we said, oh, if we can train a robot to order on a website, then it also means we can train the robot to listen to another interface, in this case being WhatsApp. So actually, um, I think we can do it in two days. It took us more than a half. And why? Because we didn't touch the legacy. We don't need to touch the legacy. You don't need to touch the applications. You need to be able to read the information. And that's such a vital change. Reading information is something completely else than going in there and retrieve the information. 
And that is what the big difference between what we call intelligent process automation is and building an API. Part small. As I said before, it is important to get the buy-in on all kinds of levels. But also to understand where your technology hiccups are, what your compliance thinks of this, what your work accounts of things of this. But then once you're there, scale fast. And scale fast might mean attracting your ecosystem. Because the skill set required in the scaling phase might not be the skill set you need in the long run. Now this does not happen without leadership. I mean, most of you have heard of the term shadow IT. And let's be honest, a lot of RPA has been sold as shadow IT somewhere in the business. And shadow IT, like SaaS, is what I consider the next level of legacy. Especially when there's a lot of maverick buying around. So it really is important, really important, that you get it out of the dark in your organization. And that means ownership. And let's be honest, we believe that CIOs are the owner of this. Because it might sound like a sales pitch, but in the end, automation has to do with systems, has to do with processes, has to do with the hardcore IT function. So yeah, there are companies that say, I want a chief robot officer, very nice, sounds good for the marketing department, but at the end of the day, it's a function in IT. So that means that the IT leaders need to dream the dream of automation and need to understand that certain areas of the classical IT function are a thing of the past and that you need to transform them. It also means that you need to have a very, very good analytical capability. You need to understand the figures. How much? What does it cost? What are throughput times? What is our average cost per employee? All these kind of things are extremely important to make the business case. This is not an emotional business case. We have seen so many business cases that were like, yeah, we're going to save a lot. And what's a lot? And then after two years, they say, yeah, we have five bots. And then we say, oh, this client had after two years almost 1,500 bots. Why? Because they understood the business case far better. And they did the analysis far more meticulously. And there is so much information in your systems. I mean, we've all had the classical ITIL education somewhere. If you know the issue, you know the problem, you know the systemic improvement. Hey. Same goes when you want to automate and you want to drive benefits. If you run this classical model, you will definitely be able to actually make it happen. Attack burning platforms. Every company has burning platforms. Every company. Might be clients, might be regulatory issues. And I have an example on that. Again, automation is about to be. We have a large client of ours, which is a really, really, really big wholesale bank in over a hundred countries, I think. And they need to state daily regulatory reports. They need to get it from somewhere like 98 different systems. And they have one accountant who has that as, their, as his core job. Now, automating this process is never going to make this accountant obsolete because it's not the only thing this accountant is doing. But there's one thing else. Actually, the chief risk officer said, the fact that I've automated this process means I'll never miss a regulatory deadline. That's impact. It has nothing to do with benefit, and that's one of the important things to understand. If you really want to do stuff, it's not about only attacking corporations, but it's by finding out where repetitive work or non-value added work with high impact can be automated. And that's definitely a burning platform in a lot of organizations. And then the last one, as I said, establish governance. We believe that establishing a good governance from the start is vital. And that you, as leaders, should be driving that. 
It's not because we as a supplier come along and say, hey, we have this model and it's as there, we need to have governance. We have learned that if you do it like that, it usually means that somebody is responsible for a program that actually he or she doesn't want, which is already a bad way to start. So take it from the top and drive it as part of your strategy. Now to wrap it up. Change management is vital. We talked about it. To give you some examples in, in that, we have seen that change management is not about putting up an internal website. It's about going to the shop floor and actually telling what you're doing, why you're doing it, and it automatically brings to the second part. Employees are your most vital resource in this game. They understand exactly what should be automated. They know also who's the best employee doing a current process. And it comes pretty close to process mining this. So there's a little room there. If you buy RPA as just a tool, you're going to be full. Because then you end up with a box of stuff you bought and it's not going to work. So focus from day one, not on buying it as a tool, but as a way how you want to manage your operations. This is about managing your workforce. This is not about managing software. Results, as we said. Everybody wins when everybody wins. And when just one party wins, which means selling a license, you're not going to get there. Joint governance, joint KPIs must be there and must be set up from the start. What do you want to achieve? Where do you want to go to? What do you want to get? And then the last one, and I haven't touched on that because I wanted to do this at the end. RPA, IPA is not about process redesign. Because a robot works completely different than a human does. Let me give you an example. Humans are pretty good at using the alt top function and switching between applications. Robots are extremely bad with that. So usually what a robot does, it opens an application, it does what it must do, closes the application and opens the next one. Which means that most of you might have the idea that throughput times with automation can be faster. Yes. Always. No. And why? Because sometimes stability is far more important than the speed of a process. Because if a process can be done in 3 minutes or 3.2 minutes, but the error rate is significantly lower when using the 3.2 scenario. And it's really a habit. But don't focus on redesigning the process, do it in a completely different way. And it also means that from a perspective of the people that do this, within your organization, people that have a lean green belt, black belt, white belt, yellow belt, none of what belts there are anymore, are actually people that understand processes, but they need to unlearn how they always did processes before they can become robotic process designers. Here, of course, is the uh, very important announcement from the sponsor. We actually believe that automation will bring value to companies. We believe it only will get there if it becomes scalable and factory style. Within all companies we have encountered, and we are quite recognized in this business, we see that when people take charge and support the business, they are much more successful than when the business decides to buy 5,000 different tools and leaves the regular CIO stranded with a whole kind of server array that needs to be arranged without not knowing what's actually in there. So on a Sunday, it's about intelligent process automation. It's about bringing stuff to scale. It's about doing things fast, being very agile, making a very simple business case, make sure that your ROI is extremely fast 
So don't go into heavy consulting kind of assignments. Find it with your own people. And to quote a very famous sports shoe manufacturer, just do it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And should you have any questions, you know where to find us and I'll be here as well. Thank you.